mean so many things, things that aren't really happening. And when they put me in the ground, I'll pound the lid, saying, I haven't finished yet. I still have a tattoo to get. But since I'm living in the moment, and it's funny how I imagined that I would win this, win this fight.
future is not a place we are going, but a place we create. When people say things like, whatever happens, happens, or my personal favorite, it is what it is, they are referencing a speculative approach towards a probable future scenario. Speculative design is a phrase thrown around a lot within the industry. I could have memorized its official academic description, but you will have to be at work in an hour, so I've summarized it a little. In a nutshell, speculative design is a design approach that starts by saying, the future is probably going to happen, so maybe it could be good. <clears throat> the moment someone acts out of intention, setting an alarm in the morning, hanging a load of washing, buying an engagement ring, they switch their future scenario from a probable one to a preferable one. That's not to say that a preferable future is foolproof, but take it from me, simply having the clarity to articulate what a desirable outcome might look like is half the job done. So in light of this, I asked myself, what would it look like to cultivate the kind of person I would like to be in the future right now? The first thing I did was to pay attention. Side note, half of design is just paying attention. I would argue all of design is just paying attention to my daily routine and the ways in which I filled my time. Being a photographer has allowed me to engage meaningfully in so many industries, but only to the extent that I give voice and agency to important work and to the work that I care about. Since the early stages of my young career, I've known that simply being the lens through which audiences experience this work wasn't really going to be enough for me long term, and that I'd one day leave photography to pursue design myself. In the meantime, I wanted to develop a practice that would make me more sensitive to the movement of time in a gentle and non-threatening way. As my small rebellion against busyness, I began this meditative exercise where I would take documents from my workday, photography, briefs, shot lists, mood boards, and fold them into little origami tulips. A direct reference to the tulips Amanda Palmer speaks about in her song, kind of as a way to physically remind myself that what I'm doing now directly leads into what I'll be doing in the future and to be intentional about that. It was during this time that I launched the design blog Bracket as a platform to interact with designers further afield. One such designer, Lex Pott, is an alumni of, drum roll, Design Academy Eindhoven and gave insight into what makes the school such a high-ranking design academy. Home to a community of many nationalities, the Design Academy is an environment where personal perspectives on the world can be translated into meaningful and daring propositions, and design is taught as an instrument of material, social, environmental, and critical innovation. In 2019, I travelled to Eindhoven myself for Dutch Design Week and spoke to graduates and current students about their experience. A few conversations with some department heads and students, and I was sold. I applied the following year and was successfully admitted. The beauty of all of this is, in my mind, was the project I submitted as part of my application, and as it turns out, the one that got me through the door. By starting this humble practice of folding scrap paper, I had unwittingly rerouted my speculative future from probable to preferable to the point that I can just delete the speculative part altogether. These days, I just call it the present. Even after landing the preferable future scenario of my dizziest daydreams, I know it doesn't always work out the way you plan it. I've learned the hard way that you can't know what you don't know, which happens to be the title of my next great epiphany. I don't know what I don't know. Part of being a design student involves being asked at every turn in every project to explain yourself as a designer, who you are, your practice, your inspiration. There's lots of people who look and sound a lot like me at the academy. And while I'm glad to find a sense of familiarity in a place so very far away from home, I realize by now that I'm a bit over the high rotation of dominant white designers scraping the barrel for stories of any stolen cultural significance and far more interested in hearing and facilitating the ones that haven't yet had a chance to be heard. Someone who has been a tremendous influence in helping me articulate this 
is one of my favorite writers and poets, Patrick Gautoin. I had the pleasure of hearing him speak at a radical theology festival in Utrecht a few years back, just after the launch of his book, In the Shelter, a personal biography and reflection on his relationship with God and religion. At this moment in my life, I'm in a bit of a wrestle of my own when it comes to faith and have borrowed greatly from his approach to critical questioning. It was here that I first came across the Japanese word mu. Mu is a one-word answer to a bad question. More specifically in this context, mu is the response when a question becomes too small for the truth of the answer, when a yes or a no answer is in error and should not be given. It says, unask the question, ask a better one. Maybe a better way to phrase epiphany number two is that the more I know, the more I realize how much I don't know. As a designer, I'd like to do a lot more listening than telling. I'd like to wait in the space between a question and an answer for the unknown, for what can emerge from unasking and reasking questions and fostering a place of empathy, knowledge, and mutual growth. In October last year, I had a chance to put this into practice. On the Beach is a project I worked on as part of a study on map making. I was, given the brief, I was given the brief to choose a border and study it over the span of a trimester, going into the field, canvassing residents through interviews and photographs. I chose to map the projected coastline of the Netherlands 100 years from today, according to the projections laid out by the rather green 2021 IPCC report. Prior to moving to Eindhoven, I had a general assumption that the Dutch stance on climate action was fairly unanimous. After all, the Netherlands, of all places, knows a few things about living below sea level. This is a map of the Netherlands before land reclamation began, roughly 13th century. This map from the present day shows just how much of the country has been quite literally built out of nothing. Roughly 17% of the total land area of the Netherlands is land reclaimed from either sea or lakes. And yet, these changes in coastline pale in comparison to the projections made in the 2021 IPCC report, with even the most optimistic reports predicting flooding as far south as Dordrecht and as far east as Vola. I'm kind of in that sort of like little bulge down there in Eindhoven. I wanted to gauge the response to this information with people on the ground. Speaking to a wide range of people from many social demographics, opened a broad spectrum of opinions on climate change, land use, local economy, COVID-19, and politics as a whole. My research protocol was to ride my little bike along this future coastline, stopping at each town and village along the way. It's a long bike ride. Interviewing local residents, I asked them first to describe the landscape and local economies, then secondly, to stand with their eyes closed and imagine themselves on the beach hundred years from now, with the land in front of them completely underwater, I would then ask them to open their eyes and we'd have a little chat about what they had brought up for them. I started in the city of Breda, an old city with a young population. The locals I spoke to were all too aware of the grim reality laid out by the IPCC and expressed an existential dread towards climate change that matched my own. A conversation with a man in Osterhout added an interesting layer to my research. Pointing to the recently established construction site behind him, he explained that more and more farms and forests are being bought up and built up by developers, commissioned by the municipality in response to the growing housing crisis, which I know about because I'm a student in the Netherlands now. While he remains skeptical of climate projections and climate change in general, he outlined a more locally imminent threat when he said, quote, building and construction is going to kill the land long before the water does. This is Walter and Kyle. Walter is 72 and has lived in his village this whole life. Apparently all the farmland around the village has been bought out by wealthy hobby farmers um, that don't actually produce anything meaningfully to contribute to the local economy, meaning that a large majority of the village commute each day to build sites of Utrecht and Amsterdam. Going out and speaking to people in person raised a lot of questions. What is the individual's responsibility when it comes to climate change? 
Is it responsible to ask people to fight against something that will affect them in 100 years when another threat is more imminent? Who wins in the war between builders and farmers in a country that is facing a housing crisis whose main economy is food export? But I had my answers, inconvenient answers, answers to questions I wouldn't have even known to ask if I hadn't gone out myself to speak with those local to the land. This was the first hint of my third great epiphany. One I think it's safe to say is my overall takeaway from my time in the academy so far, maybe even in my whole career. The best designer I can be is a local one. Before anything else, the kind of designer I want to be is one who is in tune and aware of the assets and issues within my local community, be that at a suburb, city or state level. I believe this is the only way to effectively approach the environmental and social issues facing our time. Not waiting around for corporations and big government to change their practices, instead being involved in mobilising the local community in ways that engages everyone and multiplies the output. Asset-based community-driven or ABCD development is an approach to community development that I've spent a lot of time reading up on as part of my study. This approach centers around the strengths or assets of the group rather than the needs and weaknesses. Instead of asking, what's wrong with this community? ABC D Development asks, what's good? For my final project this year, I got my friends around the dinner table to have a chat about how we as the student body might practice this approach using the Design Academy community itself as a case study. I recorded some of that conversation, which Tamara's going to share later, but um, have, have a watch. The context of sharing food together was intentional, as it leads into a project I'll be working on when I get back to Eindhoven in a few weeks. For one of the top design schools in the world, we sure have plenty to say about it. And yet, all five or six hundred of us have been picked from all over the place with qualities and skills that elected for us to be there meaning we as a student body likely have the resources to meet the exact needs we see within the institution. Throughout the next year, I want to pay close attention to what happens outside school hours, the way we live together, the way we eat together, the way we party together, write down some of the conversations we're having about the school, about how design education is changing or needs to change, and perhaps identify some of the blockers that stand between us and the meaningful work we're all aiming for. My hope in doing so is that I'll bring a bit of power back to the people uh, to take matters back into their own hands. And speaking of meaningful work, I have a little surprise for you. Bonus epiphany! I am most connected to myself when I am connected in community with others. Don't worry. I hear the irony of someone who left Brisbane saying, don't leave Brisbane, but please don't leave Brisbane. Or identify something that you think you can bring to this community. Go out, get it, and come back. This thing that we have here in Brisbane is so special. There's exciting collaborations happening all the time. There's people who've identified the needs in this community and have seen themselves as people with resources that can meet those needs. So stick around, and I'll see you when I'm back.